Good morning. If you're listening to this on uh, the morning that it was posted to YouTube, it's Easter Sunday morning. And, uh, so he is risen. Christ the Lord is risen. My name is Jeff Snow, and I am the pastor at First Baptist Church in Fort Hope. And uh, whether you're listening to this on Easter Sunday or any other time afterwards on our YouTube channel, we welcome you. I just want to share a few thoughts with you about the significance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's been a very important, a key concept in the Christian faith. And one of the things that we have to come to terms with is the reality of it, that it actually did happen. There are evidences, there are proofs for the resurrection of Jesus. There's a fellow by the name of Lee Strobel, and uh, he's written a very good book called The Case for Easter. He's written some other books called The Case for Christ, The Case for Faith. He was a journalist in Chicago in the late 70s, early 80s, and was an atheist. And his wife was a believer, a Christian. And as a journalist, he decided that he wanted to use journalistic methods to disprove Christianity and disprove the existence of God. The subtitle for this book is actually A Journalist Investigates the Resurrection, the Evidence for the Resurrection. And so he went about interviewing people and using journalistic methods and techniques to attempt to disprove um, the existence of God, disprove Christianity. And after a number of months of interviews and, and investigations, the opposite happened to him. And he found that there was evidence and sufficient proof for the validity of God and the validity of Christianity, and he became a Christian. And he's written a number of books trying to put himself still in a skeptic's seat, but asking the tough questions that skeptics might, and, and asking them of some very smart people and trying to come to some conclusions. Some of the conclusions that uh, he and some other people smarter than me have come to, but the reality of the resurrection of Christ is the fact that the tomb was empty. Historically, the tomb was empty. Now, we have to come to a, a supposition that the scriptures are historically accurate and not legend. And um, there's plenty of stuff on YouTube that you can look up to find discussions and arguments for that. We'll make an assumption for that at this point. And you can also find all kinds of stuff on YouTube that talk about evidence for the resurrection. But the tomb was empty. And the interesting thing in the scriptures, one thing that only the philosopher and theologian points out, is that the first people who discovered the empty tomb were some of Jesus' followers who were women. And in that time, first century AD, it was a very patriarchal society. And the testimony of women were, was not considered valid in court. They were, their um, say-so was not considered to be so. <laughs> People would not buy and, and, and take the testimony alone. So if somebody was to write a legend, a story about a tomb being empty and Jesus rising from the dead for first century heroes, they would not have had women find the empty tomb. It would have been a, would have been a story that would have just been dismissed. It's one, one evidence of the empty tomb. The body was never found. The Romans and the Jewish religious leaders, they would have had a stake in wanting to find the dead body and demonstrate it and parade it so that they could put an end to this crazy Jesus movement that they, that they just did not like, that was a threat to them. Um, if they could have produced a dead body, they would have. And then some would say, well, the disciples stole the body. Well, the evidence against that is how the disciples lived their life after the resurrection of Christ. Um, they, if they had stolen the body, they would have known it was a lie. And some people will um, die for what they believe, and then, but then it's discovered afterwards it's a lie. Very few people would die like eleven, of, like ten of the eleven disciples did a martyr's death, um, knowing it was a lie. But they just, you know, when it came to the point of, you know, you have to disavow what you're preaching, otherwise we're going to kill you. 
Uh, no, no, I believe it, I believe it. Okay, here's the knife, we're gonna kill you. Wait a minute, stop, okay, psych. It was all a lie, I'm just, I'm just kidding. They wouldn't, they wouldn't have um, gone to their deaths believing something that they know to be a lie if they had had this great conspiracy of trying to steal the body. Um, many people in scriptures, a variety of people saw Jesus to be alive. There's no such thing as a mass hallucination. Hallucinations are individual so, you know, circumstances. And there are many situations where many people together saw Jesus alive. Um, Millard Erickson, who's a top theologian, he says this about the change in the disciples. He says, the transformation of disciples from frightened, defeated persons to militant preachers of the gospel is an evidence of um, the power of the resurrection of Christ. Um, Strobel quotes a philosopher named J.P. Moreland. On this, and we'll read to you what he says. He says, when Jesus was crucified, his followers were discouraged and depressed. So they dispersed. The Jesus movement was all but stopped in its tracks. Then after a short period of time, we see them abandoning their occupations, regathering and committing themselves to spreading a very specific message that Jesus Christ was the Messiah of God who died on the cross, returned to life and was seen alive by them. And they were willing to spend the rest of their lives proclaiming this without any payoff from a human point of view. They faced a life of hardship. They often went without food slept exposed to the elements, were ridiculed, beaten, beaten, imprisoned, and finally most of them were executed in torturous ways. For what? For good intentions? No, because they were convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that they had seen Jesus Christ live from the dead. The resurrection of Christ totally and radically changed their, their lives, and they totally and radically changed the world with the message of Jesus. Lee Strobel, in his book, kind of summarizes the importance of the resurrection, having kind of laid out the evidence for it. He lays out the importance for it, and he says this, The resurrection is the supreme vindication of Jesus' divine identity and his inspired teaching. It's the proof of his triumph over sin and death. It's the foreshadowing of the resurrection of his followers. It's the basis of Christian hope. Let's unpack a bit of what he's saying there. The first part, the resurrection is the supreme vindication of Jesus' divine identity and his his inspired teaching. In other words, the resurrection proved that Jesus said it was who he said he was. He always said that he was God, that I am the Father alone. And so the resurrection proved that he was God. Erickson writes, contemporary Jews would have regarded the resurrection as God's confirmation that Jesus really was what he claimed to be. And we have to wrestle with that. If Many of us in society today will claim that, well, Jesus was a good moral teacher. He was a good man. I want to follow his teachings, but he wasn't, he wasn't God. But we have to wrestle with the fact that he said he was God, that he said he was going to rise from the dead, and then scripture says that he did it. If he said he was going to rise from the dead and he wouldn't, then he was a liar. If he said he was going to rise from the dead and he couldn't, he would have been a crazy person. But he said he was going to rise from the dead, and then he did it. And it provided proof beyond the shadow of the dead for his followers that he was who he said he was, that he was God. And the resurrection today that we celebrate at Easter gives us that proof in our hearts that Jesus is who he said he was, that he is the Son of God. Erickson said it's the proof of his triumph over sin and death. The resurrection proves that Jesus triumphed over sin and death. First Corinthians 15, 17 says, If Jesus has not been raised for your has not been raised from the dead, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. The resurrection from the dead proves that sin was conquered and proves that the death was conquered. First Corinthians 15. Verses 54 to 57, I read this passage at my grandfather's funeral a few years ago. He really spoke to, to me then about him and about all of us, about the power that we have, that God has given us over the, the power of death. It says, for the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, 
and the mortal with immortality than the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We have been given the victory over sin and death because Jesus in the resurrection has conquered sin and death. On the cross, we, we talked on Good Friday about how in the uh, Second Corinthians, it said that Jesus became sin for us. So in the resurrection, the consequence of Jesus becoming sin for us was his death on the cross. In the resurrection, he demonstrates that he has overcome sin's power. And that as we, we identify with Christ, sin no longer has power over us. We can be forgiven and freed from the penalty of sin. They were able to overcome its power and one day free from the presence of sin in heaven. And then we know in the because of the resurrection that the physical death that we still experience is not the final chapter in our life. It's the resurrection, the hope of resurrection of our own lives. It rests in the resurrection of Christ. Scoble says it's the foreshadowing of the resurrection of his followers. In Philippians 3, 10 and 11, Paul says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his suffering, becoming like him in death and so somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead. As we identify with Christ in his death, we say, okay, I believe that Christ paid the penalty for my sin on the cross. I accept that for myself and we are forgiven of sin. And, we, and the sin's power is broken over us. And then... Um, as we participate and identify in the resurrection of Christ, then we can experience and, and know that this life is not all there is. There's more to this life. And we can trust in the resurrection to come. But it's not just a future thing. The resurrection isn't just about the future, but it's about our hope for today as well. Um, Romans 8 to 11 says, And the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. Giving life to your mortal bodies can mean life after death, but I think it also means true life now. Jesus said that comes to give life and life more fully. And through the Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, as we welcome Jesus into our lives, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us and gives us life and breathes life into us. And I think sometimes as believers, we can sell the whole God short, sell the Holy Spirit short, you know, and think, well, can God really do this? Can God really do miracles today like he once did? Can God really change things in my life? The scripture says that the very same spirit that had the power to breathe life and raise Christ from the dead lives in us. And the spirit wants to do in and through us amazing thing that will um, that will fulfill the purpose that God has put us here on earth for. And finally, the resurrection is the key to our salvation. Romans chapter 10. Let me find it on my phone. Here. Romans chapter 10, starting at verse 9. Paul says, If you believe with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. We saved from, we're saved from our sin. We're saved from our, our tendency to want to do things our own way. And we are saved to God's purposes for our lives and why he created us. So it says that the key here is to declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Well, the implication there, if you believe God raised him from the dead, that there has to be a dead to begin with, that Jesus died for our sins. So you're believing that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. You're believing that, that he is God. And you're believing that, that he, was, he is risen from the dead and that he lives. You serve a risen Savior, the old friend said. And Jesus wants to be active. He, he exists. He's real. He loves you. And he wants to be active in your life. He wants to work by his Holy Spirit in your life. Because of the resurrection of Christ, he is living. And because he sent his spirit to live among us, um, he wants to have a living relationship with us. The reality of having our living Savior um, 
active in our lives, forgiving us of our, our wrong things, making us more and more into the image and likeness of Christ, helping us understand why we were, we were created, what our purpose is, and what God has planned for our lives. My prayer that this Easter, that you will know the power of the resurrection in your life, that Jesus is alive, he's real, and he wants to be part of your life. And it's our goal, it's our um, responsibility, our, the only part we have to do is to accept that. So Jesus is Lord, give him our lives, trust him with our lives, and believe that the resurrection proves that he is who he said he was, that he's God. Can I pray with you? Father, thank you so much for sending Jesus. For sending Jesus to die on the cross to forgive us. To bear the, the awful penalty of, of the sin of the entire world on his shoulders and in his person. Thank you, Lord, for the resurrection. That proves that Jesus is who he said he was. It validates everything he said. Thank you, Lord, that we can identify with Jesus, both in his death and resurrection, for the forgiveness of sins, and for the newness of life today, for the promise of new life in the future. Help us, Lord, to, to, um, to accept that, and help us, Lord, to live that, to live with the power that raised Christ from the dead, living in our lives, and working through us to, to do what you've called us to do on this earth, to bless others, minister to others, and point them to Jesus. Lord, we thank you. Lord Jesus, we thank you. You are the risen Christ, that you've conquered sin and death, and that you've given us this gift, this Easter. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. For watching this on Easter morning, I hope you have a really good day with your family, and, uh, and rejoice. That Jesus is risen this, this day. God bless. We'll talk to you next week.